So uh, thanks everybody for logging on. Um, a little home cooking today. Um, we're happy to uh, welcome Dr. Osama Anis uh, to our um, weekly conference. Dr. Anis is a postdoctorate fellow at the Aortic Institute uh, here at the Yale School of Medicine and um, uh, co-authored a paper with uh, several names that may be familiar to you there on the, the screen that he's showing us, including Dr. Kopp, and um, is currently uh, undergoing surgical or uh, general surgery training at Amblington Jefferson Health and uh, is looking to become, uh, you know, a, an academic surgeon and, in, in the future. Um, so, uh, Dr. Anise, thank you so much for taking the time and I uh, hope everybody enjoys your talk. Thank you so much for having me. That was very generous of you. Before I start, like Dr. Abisi mentioned that I uh, was a postdoctoral fellow at the Yordic Institute. I got the wonderful opportunity to work under Dr. Elifriotis and um, many other uh, mentors. And I reflect my time at Yale uh, very fondly. Dr. Elifriotis, as some of you might know, in our lab has been very interested in studying aortic aneurysms and how they progress, their natural history, we published a plethora of papers um, at the Aortic Institute on, on these topics. And similarly, um, over the past few years, we've had patients come in, a few of them who after heart transplant had aortic aneurysms. This isn't really a very detailed um, uh, uh, study. Our cohort was not a huge cohort, but we just thought that this would lay a groundwork to start the conversation about how um, aortic aneurysms uh, develop in heart transplant patients and just to get it going off the ground. And we studied three of our patients um, who had um, aortic aneurysms in ascending aortic aneurysm in after heart transplant, which were just confined to their um, native aorta. The donor aorta went, um, was not aneurysmal and it, gave us, it gives us a good opportunity to see how two different genetic organs uh, behave uh, in the same hem hemodynamics or in the same biological milieu. Um, the authors, uh, as listed, are myself, Dr. Kof, as who is also here, and the rest of us at the Aortic Institute. Like, but like I just mentioned before, I think the reason we, we thought that this was an interesting observation was because uh, we really don't get a chance or opportunity to see how um, the same genetic organs behave under the same uh, hemodynamics in the same environment. And the, the, both all of our patients were exposed to different, uh, the same biological environment for at least five years. So we'll start off with discussing uh, or overviewing uh, the cases and seeing their progression, and then we'll delve into a discussion. Um, a lot of you are the experts on um, aortic uh, and heart uh, hemodynamics and can obviously educate me and the rest of us on how um, into points that I might be missing and understanding how these hemodynamics play a role, which will come up in the later slides. This picture is a standalone picture. Um, I just wanted to show it to you because it was very dramatic how these aneurysms developed and how um, interesting it was for us. As you can see here that the aneurysm is just beyond the suture line and that's the native aorta and the donor aorta um, is gone completely um, unchanged or is, there's a huge transition from the suture line to, uh, pro, to the native aorta. So let's delve in. The first case was um, someone who was born with a hypoplastic left heart and had to go heart transplantation as an infant. And we saw him 14 years after. One of our metrics was seeing how long they were exposed to this new milieu. Uh, we mentioned the profile here because as we know that um, uh, body dynamics, your height, your weight are indicative of uh, development of aneurysm. We've also published a paper on that. I can link that later. And one of the other metrics that we were uh, seeing when we did our literature search um, and seeing our patients was their, the medicine they were on, for example, steroids, which could have played a role, which we'll discuss in the upcoming slides. So this, uh, this person, they developed a severe aortic enlargement over the, over, the, over the next few years, 14 years to be exact, and their aorta grew from 4.5 to 6.8 centimeters over 
a span of four years, and they were just being followed up um, uh, as part of their heart transplant. Um, and some of them did not even have symptoms uh, from their aneurysm per se, it also, which was also reflected in our literature search. As mentioned before, their, their proximal aorta, the transplanted aorta, remained normal in size, and there was an abrupt transition in their, uh, from the native to the donor aorta. Unfortunately, we did not have, a, have CAT scans for a lot of these patients because uh, of how the charts were um, kept, but uh, we do have, I do have scans for one of our patients, which, is, which, was, very, which was very interesting and very remarkable. This is just a picture of um, uh, histology of how the native uh, uh, looked in a lot of these patients, they had elastic uh, wall artery with medial mixed artery generation, which is something we see in a lot of our uh, aortic aneurysms and something we're also um, studying uh, how the lamellar units vary in aortic aneurysms. Uh, like I said before, uh, this set a foundation for us to go ahead and study and understand what are the factors that actually contribute to these aneurysms in transplant patients. And one of them is pathology and histology and how that varies in between normal and um, uh, pathology. Case number two was uh, someone who uh, underwent heart transplant for long standing bicuspid valve disease. And they were 42 when they got their heart transplant and they came back, they were seen at the Aortic Institute 17 years later uh, for, uh, and were found to have an ascending aortic aneurysm. Again, in this case, the native aorta was noted to be enlarged uh, and thin walled at the time of um, presentation. And they ultimately were found to have a large 5.6 centimeter aortic arch aneurysm. Again, the, native, the donor aorta was spared. We did a redo surgery when they were around 59, like I said, 17 years after their initial operation. And um, similarly, we found a similar, similar anatomy in this, in this case. This was an artist's rendition of what the aorta looked like. Uh, the picture on the left uh, shows an, the aneurysm right beyond the suture line with the uh, donor transplant, sorry, the known aorta being spared. And the picture on the right shows uh, a picture of the repair that we uh, did in some of these patients. Case number three similarly was someone who had heart transplantation eight years uh, before the presentation to our institute and they had congenital bicuspid aortic stenosis. And he, this person also had had two aortic valve replacements and uh, had end-stage heart failure. His, similarly, in this case as well, we saw that the transplant uh, aorta grew in six centimeter, grew up to six centimeter in diameter and the, nat and the uh, sorry, the, sorry, the native aorta grew six centimeter in diameter, but the transplant aorta was, uh, was gone um, uh, spared. And in a lot of these cases, it made us wonder what the donor pathology or the donor genetics look like. And unfortunately, in our case, we were not able to retrieve data on what the donor aorta looked like because it makes you wonder um, that what if the donor aorta was never predisposed to aneurysm or they did not have any genetic conditions such as Marfan's that we know about. Uh, and I think this is something that we wanna study going forward to see how um, donor genetics and donor, um, donor's cause of death sometimes or their comorbidities affect um, uh, rates of aneurysm and why they're spared um, or why they have been spared in our, in our case at least. Similarly, we performed um, uh, aortic uh, uh, surgery in this patient as well and noted similar, a similar anatomy. And this is what we found in our literature search. The first three patients are patients who, uh, at our institute the next few, uh, and during our search of uh, patients with similar presentations, we, we did not find a lot of data that had been published on patients who had had similar episodes. The, from what I remember, the largest um, cohort I found was of nine patients and, um, and that was it. And they talked a lot about how the mechanics and the hemodynamics affect uh, aortic uh, antigen formation in these patients, which we'll, which we'll discuss more. Uh, but I think a lot of work needs to be done in this very interesting uh, area because we don't get to see um, different genetic organs coming in contact and being in the same biological environment very often. So this is one of the scans for one of our patients. On the left, you see the donor aorta. It's, um, uh, as you can see, 38 millimeter in diameter. And on the, on the right, you see that the native aorta is 62.6 millimeters. 
and I'll be sorry, as, as we progress through these slides, I would, um, you guys can uh, drop in any questions that you want in the comment box and we can discuss them. But again, I think this is more of a learning opportunity for all of us. And I would really appreciate all the feedback and input I can get um, so that we can build upon this study. So uh, there were a few factors that we looked upon and went through charts of patients who uh, we treated and patients from uh, our uh, end of, of our search. And we, we came across a few common variables which they were implicating in the disease process, which include, included uh, abnormal mechanosensing, abnormal transduction, the role of um, MMPs, DGF beta, the role of uh, hemodynamics and how the role of uh, what kind of suture was used, the role of how long the aorta was at the um, time of uh, surgery. And we obviously have experts here who can comment better on that. Moving forward, this is the picture back again. With genetics, um, it was very interesting uh, when we were going through the data, there were papers that cited or talked about how, and we, uh, a lot of us might know that a lot of uh, how uh, MMP9, for example, could serve as a potential biomarker uh, for the diagnosis of aortic disease. And they were trying to understand that in patients who have um, increased expression of these genetic signals, uh, what uh, could be the cause. And they were trying to understand uh, if genes do really play a role. In our research, we, we saw that uh, a lot of papers also talked about how compliance mismatching was a factor that could have played a role in because of the different aortic calibers uh, that were anastomosed. With genetics, especially, our, we were interested in the fact that uh, because these aortas are, are exposed to the same biological environment, despite being exposed to the same biological environment, only one part of the only the native aorta develop aneurysms and not the uh, donor aorta, making a case or trying to uh, establish a foundation for the role of genetics. And this is one, one study that I came across, which was um, uh, trying to quantify the level of TPA in aneurysms versus control. And as you can see that it was higher in um, aneurysmal aerotas, which makes sense because they progress to uh, pathology versus control. And uh, similarly, they also studied uh, these levels in marfanoid aerotas. Another factor that, or other variable, how we studied was steroid use. And in, in, this, in, our, in our search, we found that there were a few papers that cited steroid use, um, and perhaps some of our transplant surgeons can educate us here better, that steroid use also increased the risk of aortic aneurysms. And Shijima Y et al., uh, whose paper this uh, table from, uh, hypothesized that there was a uh, and uh, a role between uh, or um, connection between oral steroid use and AAA, AAA expansion. But um, as all papers have limitations, their paper uh, did not really study uh, other drugs that were um, the patient had been receiving as part of their heart transplant regimen and their other comorbidities. So um, some work also needs to be done, done in that arena. Brigano et al., their paper, uh, I think, was the one that I um, that had the largest cohort, and they talked a lot about compliance mismatching. And um, they felt that um, given the difference in the donor aorta and the uh, recipient aorta and their mechanical properties at baseline, which could not be studied because this wasn't also not a comprehensive study like ours, they could also play a role in the wall tension and, critical and can affect the critical stress factor leading to aneurysm formation. And these were some of the basic uh, points that we were able to be studied. And there's a lot to build upon. There's a lot to be said about um, all these variables. But um, I would really appreciate input from some of the experts here. And I just want to know what you guys think. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, um, uh, Dr. Anis. I don't know if Dr. Koff, um, as a co-author on the paper, if uh, you have any comments that you'd like to share before we uh, offer other people a chance to ask questions. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, this, I think, is a very um, interesting finding. Um, 
and so forth. Can you um, do, do genetic testing on your donor house? Like, for example, um, can you test for uh, MMP of regulation or anything of that sort? Um, not, not to my knowledge. I mean, you know, obviously there's a number of um, preoperative um, evaluations that are done, but not specifically for that enzyme to, um, to my knowledge. I, the things that kind of stuck out to me, and then I, if anybody else out there has a question, um, you know, feel free to uh, raise your hand or just, uh, just chime in, um, I guess is a few things. So in, in, your, th in your three patients, two of them had congenital heart disease because you had one at the bicuspid aortic valve and the one with the hypoplastic left, um, left heart syndrome. So, so you'd think there'd be some underlying genetic abnormalities probably in those folks, um, which goes along, I think, with your, your hypothesis, you know, that there's some, some type of genetic predisposition to this. And maybe there's epigenetic um, influences you know, with the hemodynamics that might result or the meds being used, I guess, based upon what those other papers are suggesting. But do you know, I guess the questions I have would be interesting is kind of like from an epidemiologic standpoint, you know, it'd be interesting to see, is this something that um, uh, in patients that don't have these types of, you know, that are not, um, ha have a congenital, you know, heart disease as their part of their, um, uh, presentation for uh, heart transplant evaluation is do we see these types of aneurysmal formations in patients that you know don't have this don't have some suspected underlying genetic ab abnormalities and then the other side um, would be if it's there's some epigenetic risk factors that maybe go along more so with the immunosuppression is there any do you know is there anything out there about um, patients you know for with other organ transplants that might have a higher um, higher incidence of developing, uh, you know, aortic aneurysms, either uh, thoracic or abdominal. It's um, like in in heart transplant, we we use you know obviously immunosuppression, but with the steroids, steroids we don't keep them on um, long term. While there is other organs, uh, you know, solid organ transplant programs that that do so, like um, the renal transplant programs. So I don't know if you have any any ideas or want to speak to any of those things that I just mentioned. Yeah, those are very interesting questions that also came up when we were uh, studying the our, our patients. A lot of patients in our literature search, because ours was just three patients, right? In our search, we ha did not have any underlying genetic uh, predisposition, which was making the case for hemodynamic factors that could have contributed. For example, the critical angle between the donor and the rest of the aorta, Rugano et al. Com commented on that as well, saying that our patients had no known genetic abnormalities um, but it's also fair to say that they had not, might have not gone and undergone whole genomic sequ sequencing, or they might not have any known genetic um, uh, uh, conditions. But uh, that is very, a very valid point that I think we should uh, incorporate into in future research. And to answer your second question, um, I think you talked about epigenetic risk factors. And I feel like, um, similar to my first answer, it's very important to understand that that's why I brought this up initially, that the genetics of the donor aorta are also very important to understand and see if they if they had any any um, any um, risk for developing uh, aneurysms. And I think only once we understand what both the donor and uh, recipient genetics were, we can go ahead with a more standardized study and understand the mechanisms underlying uh, aneurysm formation in heart transplant patients, which is obviously not the easiest to do, but it's something somewhere we can start. Uh, any other questions or comments out there from the group? Um, any of our transplant team have any uh, experience or anecdotes they want to share with any of our patients that might have had similar issues? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so. How many of your patients again had um, donor 
Aynı özünde. Özü ama. Özü. Ya öz gibi hem. Several patients. Biz de onu vermiyoruz. In our in our study, actually, yes. So not in our experience personally, but in in the in the study that I went through, there were patients who had donor aneurysms but did not have any recipient aneurysms. We don't include that in our study, but I did come across quite a lot of uh, papers with uh, with with also which, who also had donor aneurysms but their their recipient aorta was um, uh, spared. Again, proving our point that it's a genetics, not proving our point well, but trying to uh, help us build upon the point that genetics do play. Uh, huge factor in the development of these aneurysms. So, so you're stating that like the donors had aneurysms in other locations? Yes, in the in the ascending aorta and not the recipient recipients. So what we what we talked about is the flip side of that. Right, right, right. Um, but then these patients themselves, they I guess you said they didn't go on to develop the thoracic aneurysms. They, they went on to develop aneurysm, but they didn't have aneurysms when uh, uh, during when they were getting transplants. We, I think we also can study. We also I also found some patients who had uh, uh, aneurysms in other vessels before they were transplanted, like popliteal arterial aneurysms or iliac artery aneurysms before transplant, and they went on to develop aneurysms in their thoracic aorta, which was also very interesting too. Yeah, that'd be. Um, yeah, that's that'd be interesting. I'm just trying to think like through how like a mechanism of action would be for that. You know, it's different different tissue um, sources, patient versus donor. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting thing. I think like you know, obviously, you know, uh, it's a, it's a very interesting question. The reason why I was really um, interested when I saw you publish this paper is that you know it's something that at least in my uh, short time as a transplant cardiologist, I didn't really think about very often. And, um, you know, but this obviously makes a lot of sense that it's something that needs to be on our radar for our heart transplant patients. And, um, you know, and we have had patients that have had these complications, but, um, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting to kind of get a better idea, like epidemiologically, how common it is and things like that, which I don't know if anybody's ever looked into that, but, you know, that'd be, that'd be nice to see if, how big of a problem it really might be across the population, transplant population, yeah. Well, if there's no... Uh, anyway, has, um, have you ever done a transplant with the, uh, the donor heart developed a cardiomyopathy? Uh, yeah, there's been instances where we've had, you know, um, donor hearts that then, you know, patients that then need to be evaluated for retransplantation. That could be for, you know, all sorts of reasons. Sometimes that's uh, due to uh, rejection. Sometimes that might be due to cardiovascular disease, either, you know, cardiac allograft vasculopathy or just old fashioned ASCVD. Um, uh, you know, so there's definitely, I mean, there's, there's definitely a cohort of patients that get retransplanted. I don't know, like, if you would see somebody who would develop like a dilated cardiomyopathy or something like this, you know, I'm sure it happens because it's in the population, but how common that would be, um, it'd probably be unclear uh, yeah. to me. It would be pretty uncommon, but uh, like um, in those patients where the donor heart uh, basically um, falls apart, do you uh, test those hearts? or cardiomyopathy genes? Oh, I, I'm not aware of that being done. Um, that's yeah. a good question to see. Yeah, if, uh, if those failing hearts have some type of genetic predisposition to, to that. It's a good question. I have no idea. I've never, seen, I've never seen any literature or anything on that type of idea before. So that's a good question. Right. Well, I think I think this paper just shows that um, you know the, the, the genes pretty much dominate the phenotype in this particular situation. Yeah, and it's I mean 
it's not that surprising, really. I mean, once the uh, organ has, um, you know, the uh, MMT upregulation or so on, um, the aorta, you know, is, is going to uh, continue to expand, whereas the donor heart does not have it. Um, it's going to be normal. So um, uh, perhaps uh, in the future, we'll be able to do some genetic engineering. <laughs> but, um, but for now, um, I mean, this paper really shows what most people expected it to show, that, um, that donor hearts that are normal and the aorta with no, without the um, MMP or upregulation, they will stay normal. And the uh, physical aorta with the uh, abnormal genes will develop aneurysms. And, uh, so basically it shows that there's not a lot of like hormonal effect on these tissues. It's, it's basically in the, in the genes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I suggested that they, the title of the table should be uh, Nurture versus nature, but they thought that would be too slick a title for this. So, but basically, um, in this particular case, it's nature, not nurture, that wins out. That may not, that may not be true for other, other entities, you know, um, other diseases, but in, in this case, it, it seems to be true. And that's based on a very small number of cases. So I have to be very careful about generalizing it. But we've, we've, never, we've never observed the opposite. We've never observed um, people develop aneurysms when they have some kind of predisposition for it. It definitely has some good hypothesis generating material there about things you could continue to do in your career, Dr. Anise. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, Perhaps you can use nature versus nurture title for the, the next paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you again so much for taking the time and uh, sharing this with us. Uh, we appreciate, you know, it's uh, something that we don't get to, like I said, we don't think about very often or think we haven't discussed in our group. At least as long as I've been here. So appreciate you joining us and, and uh, sharing this topic with us. Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely to see you guys and hear your expert opinion on this. And perhaps we can collaborate uh, in the future on some other papers. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. You take care. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank All you. Right, bye bye.